and it's the log of the hydrogen ion concentration. With these HNO3, strong acid, that's nitric acid, H2SO4, sulfuric acid, strong acid, and, and HCl, hydrochloric acid. So these are all strong acids. So remember that that way you know strong acids forms 100% hydrogen ion. So the concentration of the acid is all that you have to plug in to figure out the pH. So the pH is minus the log of the, they say H3O plus or H plus or acid concentration, any of those all means the same thing. So if you've got the graphing calculator, you put it in as it's written. Let me unfreeze it. If you don't have a graphing calculator, if you have the old calculators like the ones that I have, you've got to put it in kind of backwards because you've got to put the numbers in first. So in this one, when I go to put this in, the first thing that I put in the calculator is I have to put the concentration. So in putting in the concentration, remember that you have to use the EE button. So it's going to, you put 2.5 and then you hit that EE button once and then you put in a negative six. So it should look like 2.5 and then two little numbers up in the upper right hand corner on the calculator, put the negative six in. That's two times, 2.5 times 10 to the minus six. Then you hit the log button and then you hit the little plus minus button that's down near the equal sign. So it looks kind of like that, okay? For if you have a graphing calculator, it's just a little negative in parentheses down near your enter button or equal button. Same thing, it just changes the sign. If you have a graphing calculator, you just put minus, then log, then put in the, the concentration. So 2.5, log, make it negative, and I got 3 point, no, hold on, make sure I had it cleared, 2.5 EE, and it's 6 negative, and the log of that is 5.60, Anybody not get that? Okay, so put in clear, clear it. What kind of calculator do you have? Okay, so you gotta put your negative button, see the little minus button in the parentheses? Put that, then hit log. Uh-huh, and then 2.5, do you know how to put exponents in that? You, okay, so then put in the exponents and equals. So if you have a graphing calculator, you put it in the way it's written. Did you get this? 5.60205991. Okay. Right, so remember you gotta hit the little plus minus button at the end. See your little negative? It's Right? So it is minus the log. So put your negative in first. Mm -hmm. Huh? If you have a negative 2.5. Yep, so you have a negative symbol, then the log symbol. Then the log is used in here. Negative, then log. Then 2.5. And then if you go second EE, that puts it into the exponent. And then see that? That blue E, the little E, E, second and E, second to the comma button, is the one that puts it in exponent, then you put in negative six. And you put what is, what is, so you see in this button, see where it's a little plus minus, that's that button. Okay, if you have a graphing calculator, it looks like parentheses with a negative, it's always down in the lower kind of right corner on the keypad. It's always next to the decimal point. All that is is to change the sign. So if you have the old calculator, you have to put it in the way I've written it in black. If you have a new gra or graphing calculator, you put it in straight. Put a negative button or negative, then the log, and then the concentration. Okay? So in this, I can't keep 5.0602. 5.60205991, I have to round this to what? Mm -hmm. So see two significant figures in the answer. So that tells me how to round. So 5.6 is the first two significant figures coming from the left. So that means all the rest of those get dropped off. So my pH here would just be 5.6. So is this a, is this strongly acidic, mildly acidic, strongly basic, mildly basic, or is this neutral? Mildly what? 
a set it. Good. Mm -hmm. So this would be something that would be considered mildly acidic. It's pretty dilute. Okay. It is a strong acid, but it's very dilute, which is why the pH is closer to seven. So if you have an H2SO4 solution that has a pH of 3.80, what is this? So 3.80 is this mildly acidic, strongly acidic, neutral, mildly basic, strongly basic. Hmm? Yeah, pH of three is kind of like that cutoff. So I would say, remember on the going from that zero to 14 scale, things that are down from say zero to really zero to three is the strong base, is the strong acid. Whereas if you come up anything above 10, 10 to 14 is that strongly basic. And then anything that's in between, so this one's like right, it's not, it's not really strongly acidic or weakly, it's kind of right in the mid midpoint. Of course you call me now. This would be considered like mildly acidic. That three to four range is a little squirrely because it's not an exact thing. But then anything above seven going up to 10, that that's going to be more mildly basic. Remember on that scale, the closer you are to seven, the more neutral. So if I have this constant, if I get a pH, which remember pH has no unit value, it's just the log value. And so in this, to figure out its hydrogen ion concentration, you need to do this like the formula in reverse. So I'll do it in red if you have the graphing calculator. So if you have that graphing calculator, you have to hit the second button, then the log button. And then the parentheses comes up and you put in the pH as a negative, okay? That's the graphing calculator. If you have the old school calculator, I'll put it in black. So in that one, I have to put a, I have to put 3.80, 3.80. Then I have to hit that little plus minus button to change the sign because it's gotta be a negative pH. Then you hit the second button and then the log button. So you got to put in 3.80, make that negative. It has to be a negative 3.80. Then hit the second button and the log button. And the answer that I got is 1, 2, 3, 1, 5, 8, 4, 8, 9. That would be molar because that's a concentration. That capital M would go after that for concentration. So remember, if this one, I don't have to worry about it because I have enough significant figures for rounding with this one. But remember that you can go back and forth from scientific notation to regular expanded form is what I call this. There's no exponents in it. So if I have this in scientific notation and your graphing calculator may come up and give you this four eight nine three one nine two times 10 to the minus fourth molar. So you might see one of those. They're exactly the same, right? One's just in exponents. The other one is not. Those are the exact same numbers. But notice the one with exponents, you get all the possible significant figures. But it's not really going to change because 3.80, when I go to round this, what do I got to round it to? Nope, 3.80. So I have three. Remember, the zeros after the decimal place are significant. So that means when I come along, remember zeros out front, you don't count. The first three significant figures would be the one, the five, and the eight. So the first three significant figures you come to from the left, same thing would be here. The next number is a four, so that means all of that does what? Yeah, gets rounded off. So you could have 0 0.000158 molar or you might have 1.58 times 10 to the minus fourth molar. Those are the exact same numbers, just written different ways. So your calculator can come up and show either. Put a note to yourself with these calculators to switch between scientific notation and expanded English. That's the second button in the number four. That puts it in English. The second button in number five puts it in scientific notation. So those are really two to be able to flip if you have a graphing calculator, then you probably know how to do it. <laughs> if you don't know how to switch it, let me know at the end of class and I'll try to show you exactly. Because everyone seems to have like some variations on that. Some graphing calculators always put things in scientific notation. You have to go in and change like how it's displayed if you don't want to see it that way. Do we need to be able to 
it? No, but, okay. but you need to be able to recognize those are the same, okay? That those two numbers. So if on the test, say if it's, it's a multiple choice question and I gave you the first one and your calculator gave you the second one, you should be able to recognize that those are the same numbers, okay? So last one, if HCl solution is a pH of 6.34, what is its concentration? You're going to follow the exact same steps for, step for that second example. If you're given the pH, put in, if you've got the graphing calculator, use the red instructions. If you've got the old school calculator, then you want to follow the black instructions for that. So I'm going to put in 6.34. I'm going to make it negative and take the inverse log, which is the second button. It's a 10 to the X. The answer I got for this, 4.5708818896 times 10 to the minus 7. You might also got one, two, three, four, five, six, four, five, five, four, five, seven. Remember, both of those would be molar for concentration. And again, in this, irregardless, whichever one that you got, you could figure out, you can do the rounding for that fine. Because 6.34, how do I have to round that to? How many significant figures? Three. Mm -hmm. So I want three significant figures in my answer. Well, you can actually see three significant figures in both of the way these are written out. So in both of these, the next number is a zero. So that's why all of that would just round off. So it would be fine if you had 4.57 times 10 to the minus seventh molar or 0 0.0000000457 molar. I really encourage you to just double check your zeros, okay? Because I had some people like in doing the parts per million, parts per billion in the take home exam, people that like missed a point, all you did is you left a zero out. So you were like writing your answers down, but you left a zero out. So you ended up getting something that was either 10 times greater or 10 times smaller. So just count the number of zeros on your calculator before you transcribe it on your exam paper. Okay, so make sure that you do the acids and bases, the post-lecture homework. There's a couple of these as well, getting you to kind of practice them, putting them in your calculator, completing them. Chapter 10 is what we started last time. And so in chapter 10, it's all about proteins. So I told you proteins are really the last nutrient molecule. We've talked about carbohydrates. We've talked about lipids. So proteins are the last ones. So I'll just give you a sort of reminder update on what the schedule is for the rest of the semester. We really only have three classes after this one. Okay. So in this, so today we're going to work on protein structure and function. We'll probably get close to finishing chapter 10, but it may be another 10 minutes or so that we'll need to spend on Thursday. And then we'll cover nucleic acids and, and the structure of DNA, RNA to finish out this. So it does mean that we won't cover all of chapter 11. It does mean that we won't cover anything in chapter 12. So next Tuesday is exam five. Now, if you have 90s and higher on your exam so far this semester, you don't have to take exam five. You can use that one as your dropped one. So I suggest that you look at your average, look and see, okay, if you had a low exam grade, then it's definitely worthwhile taking exam five. But if you, if you had consistently high exam grades, then don't worry about exam five, just start studying for the final. That's like one of the pluses of doing well all along. Don't worry about exam five. I'll give you the final exam review on Thursday. The final exam is going to be 44 questions. There will be four questions from each chapter. I'll give you an exam review that will actually tell you the topic for each of the questions on the final. So, for example, question number one, this may be a balancing equation question. So you need to make sure, can you balance equations? If you haven't learned it all semester, maybe now is the time to learn. Okay, so we have tutors that are like basically sit in the still and do nothing all week long. Okay, but they are there and more than willing to help in any way that you need in terms of like practicing things that chapter two may have a question about like identifying types of radioactive decay. So you just need to go back. What is alpha? What is beta? What is gamma? How would you pick those out? You can have a note 
card for this as well. In fact, it's fine. You can have a note page. I don't really care. All right. So you can have like an entire page of notes that you can use for those to write down those examples and things that you can use on the final. Okay. So I'll give that out on Thursday, but it'll be up through just chapter 11. So that's why there's 44. Now I will leave chapter 12 open for mastering. So if you don't have an overall average of 80% yet on in mastering for pre-lecture or for the post-lecture assignments, you have the option of doing chapter 12 and those will actually just count as extra points, okay? So if you already have an 85, don't bother because you're not gonna get tested on it. But if you have a 50 average in mastering, there's an opportunity to bump that average up a little bit, okay? So I'm not going to count it as required, so it's not points. It's really just basically extra points that you can do to improve that grade. Remember that if you have an overall average of 80% in mastering in the post-lecture homework and an average of 80% in the pre-lecture assignments, those automatically get bumped up to 100. So those two grades count about 21% of your grade. So if you currently have a really low score, then you definitely want to do those. If you have like a 98 right now, you don't have to do chapter 12, okay? Just do the ones, just finish up the ones because it's you're already kind of be beyond where you need to be. So if you've got other things going on, other assignments, things that you have to finish up for other classes as well as studying for the final, that's the time I would spend doing that. I would spend time working on the final material. But if you have a low mastering score, that can help your grade to try and get it up as close to 80% as possible. Okay? No. And that's why I'm going to give you your final um, review on Thursday so that if you're not going to take the fifth exam, you don't have to come on Tuesday. Okay. All right. So we talked about amino acids, the fact that they've got, th that they are the building blocks of proteins, that there's 20 different ones. And we talked about how this shape, the structure of an amino acid, all amino acids have this structure. So all of them have this in common. There's a nitrogen, a carbon, and a carbon. The nitrogen on the left, or the one, the only nitrogen, has three hydrogens attached to it. The middle carbon always has a hydrogen. The right carbon, or the end carbon, always has two oxygens on it. One's a double bond, the other one's an oxygen. And oftentimes the nitrogen has a positive charge, the oxygen has that negative charge. So all, and they sometimes call that like the backbone because that is what is the same in every single amino acid. So amino acids differ by this. So that R group, that group that I've got starred right here, that is the part of the amino acid that makes one amino acid different from another. In fact, depending on what this group is, there is a very, like 19 out of 20 amino acids are actually chiral. So here's like an example in this one. So you can see in this, there's like a nitrogen group on one side, that carboxylate group above, a hydrogen, to the right, and then that R group pointing down. So all four of those groups are different. So what's kind of nice though is unlike carbohydrates where like carbons three, four, and five are all chiral, here there's only ever one chiral carbon, okay? So that means amino acids can exist, remember, as non-superimposable mirror images. So you can think about them that they make almost like there's a right-handed and a left-handed form of every amino acid. But unlike sugars, where D sugars are the most common, remember D glucose was the one that to remember, in nature, amino acids almost always exist as an L form. So it's just sort of an interesting thing that they're not all exactly the same, that these ones are found in that L form. So they are much more prevalent as one form of that chiral carbon. So you could take and split the 20 amino acids really into just two groups. You can say the amino acids have R groups that are hydrophilic or R groups that are hydrophobic. So if they're hydrophobic, then those R groups are going to be nonpolar. So if we pull this, I'm going to see if it'll do it sometime. Nope. <laughs> so in this, can you see the purple? So the purple is the R group. 
do you see carbon, 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 nothing but carbon and hydrogen, right? So remember things that have nothing but carbon and hydrogen are nonpolar. So the R groups, if the R groups have nothing but carbon and hydrogen, there is another example. If we come over here, this one up at the top, see the methyl group, so just a CH3. Leucine has a four carbon group that is branched, but notice nothing but carbon and hydrogen. Even down here, looking at phenylalanine, which has an aromatics. Remember, that's the six-membered ring with the alternating single and double bonds. So that also, nonpolar. All of these are considered hydrophobic, and that's going to affect where these amino acids like to be when the protein folds. Just as a note, do you remember PKU? So PKU, this was a disease that can be diagnosed on a newborn. It is a disease where they're missing the amino, the, sorry, they're missing the enzyme to be able to break down the amino acid phenylalanine. So there's phenylalanine, okay? The, one of the 20 amino acids. The problem is, is a, a baby, start off just fine, but if they can't break down phenylalanine, it begins to build up into toxic levels in the body and it ends up having neurological effects in development. So that's one of the ones that we talked about like way back in chapter five, but I told you like, so baby comes in and they're fine, but then as they come in for their eight weeks, their 12 weeks, as they come along in their checkups, you start to see that reflexes are delayed, developmental changes are delayed, and it's all because of buildup of phenylalanine, which is why they do a heel prick and they test every newborn for this disease because you can just put them on a low phenylalanine diet and you don't end up with any of the symptoms. So that's not something that's not treatable. And so that's a, a one that is one that we've talked about before. So remember these nonpolar ones, hydrophobic, the R groups have carbon and hydrogen. So they're kind of like the oils, the greases, the waxes, there's three more. The last three that are shown here, let me see if it'll do it. <laughs> Ooh, good. <laughs> sometimes it does it, sometimes it won't stop doing it. There's no telling. So here's one. So this one's methionine. So methionine is actually one of the only two amino acids that contains sulfur. So notice that that would be considered a thiol. Remember the thiols are the sulfur containing functional groups. Down here, here's tryptophan. So tryptophan is considered hydrophobic even though it does have a nitrogen. It's hydrophobic because there's so many carbons. So it's got an aromatic ring to it. It's also got a little five membered ring and additional carbon on there. So that nitrogen has less of an effect. So if it was smaller, it would be polar. But because it's got so many rings around it, then that's going to kind of like bl blank out the nitrogen's polarity. And so this is still considered one that's nonpolar. So an interesting thing about tryptophan, look, you're being all nice today, is tryptophan can be used to synthesize serotonin. So where have you heard of serotonin? In the brain. So serotonin is a neurotransmitter. Serotonin in the brain is involved in things like memory, but one of its big functions is that it actually has a mood altering effect. So serotonin is kind of like the calm, happy, peaceful neurotransmitter. <laughs> That's how I think about it. Is this the one that sort of like helps to keep you from like being depressed, helps keep you from being like too upset. It's one that sort of like helps to level out mood. People that have low serotonin levels oftentimes struggle with what? Depression. Mm -hmm. Prozac is a common medication that they use in treating depression and it actually increases the amount of serotonin that stays in the synapse, stays between the two neurons when they're sending impulses to try and improve or prolong that kind of elevation of mood the calm, happy, peaceful sensation. But tryptophan, which is found in very high concentration in proteins that you would get when you eat turkey meat, can be converted into serotonin. So there's always been talk about like, how do you feel after you have the big Thanksgiving dinner? Sleepy, mm -hmm. calm, not so upset. And that's all like that connection that they make is that tryptophan gets converted into serotonin. 
I think it's because you eat 3,000 calories in one sitting. And so therefore your whole GI tract is like, we have to digest and your muscles are like, well, we can't do anything. <laughs> so we're going to have to like lay here in the hyperglycemia <laughs> and just sit for a while while we do digestion. But very similar looking when you look at the structures of that amino acid and just how similar serotonin actually looks to it. Okay, so nine, nine nonpolar amino acids out of 20, so almost half. Nine that are considered hydrophobic because they don't want to mix with water. Then we've got six that are polar. They are polar because they have, I can't believe it's doing it today. <laughs> Yay. <laughs> they are polar because they have oxygens and nitrogens. The R group is pretty small and they have oxygens and nitrogens that are going to add that polarity and allow them to mix with water. So remember that makes them polar or hydrophilic. So you can see in that first one, like serine has an alcohol group coming down. Tyrosine, again, has an alcohol group on it. Then you have ones like asparagine. That's got an alcohol and a nitrogen. So this one's going to be really hydrophilic, really attracted to water. Going across, there's glutamine. There's the other file, cysteine. Cysteine's little, and so that sulfur adds to its ability to interact with water. And then the last one up here, so threonine has an alcohol group kind of branching off of one in the carbon, but it's small enough that it allows it to be hydrophilic mixing with water. So we got nine hydrophobics. We have six that are polar, so that makes 15. So the other 15 five are, nope, the other five are these. And these ones are what they call the charged or ionic R groups. So can you see this first one? Aspartate has a two oxygens, which would make it hydrophilic, but it's one of those oxygens has a charge, which is going to make it very hydrophilic. Same thing going down here, there's lysine. So lysine has four carbons in a chain. So you would think, oh, well, maybe that's not, maybe that's nonpolar. But on the end is a nitrogen with a positive charge. So that definitely makes it hydrophilic because of that charge. Same thing here, histidine. Two nitrogens, one of them with a charge. And then arginine, two ni three nitrogens, sorry. But one of those nitrogens has a charge as well. So all of these ones, they're also hydrophilic, and it's really because they have this charged nature on the R group. So that beige part, if you look, notice the beige NCC, NCC, NCC. So you see the same, that beige part and all of these amino acids, that is the part that's in common. All the amino acids have that kind of beige area, that beige um, structure. It's the purple part that's actually different from one to another. Okay. So there are nine that are hydrophobic, 11 that are hydrophilic. Just kind of keep those in mind. You do not have to memorize structures. <laughs> okay. You do not have to memorize names. So you don't have to be able to tell me the names of the 20 amino acids. If you find this very interesting, you can take a biochemistry class. <laughs> Out of the 20, and you may have noticed, like with this one, can you see that arginine and histidine and lysine, the ones down there at the bottom, do you see they got a little star? There's like a little asterisk in front of each of their names. And if you flip back, you'll see like threonine has one. And then looking back, methionine and tryptophan have them. Those stars indicate what they call essential amino acids. Essential amino acids you have to get in your diet. Your body cannot make them. So this is when, when people are protein deficient, they can't make the proteins that the body needs for functioning, and it's because they're not getting those essential. Adults, we can make 12 amino acids. Eight of them are considered essential, so this means they must be obtained in your diet. Newborns and infants up until about age six 
they have they can't make two other amino acids. So if you count those little asterisks, you'll actually see ten of them have asterisks. So newborns and infants actually have ten that are essential. But once you reach about the age of six to eight, your body actually can convert from other nutrients. It can convert those other two essential amino acids, so they're not considered essential anymore. So where do you get this in your diet? Most common source of protein is from any kind of meat. In fact, all protein that comes from animal products are called complete proteins, and that is because they contain all the essential amino acids. So this is beef, chicken, pork, fish, any kind of egg, milk, cheese, any kind of dairy, because all that would be considered an animal product. Those all contain all the essential amino acids. Some have them in higher concentration than others, but they do all have all of them. So in some countries, animal products are very difficult to come by. You may not have refrigeration. They're very expensive. And so in many countries, like having meat at every meal is not really an option. Not only that, but there are people that eat completely plant-based diets. So true vegans do not eat any kind of animal product. And so you're like, well, where would they get their essential amino acids? So they have found that there are incomplete protein sources, which are your plant sources. So the only way you can get all of the essential amino acids is making sure that you eat a wide variety of plant-based foods. So in grain, so this would be wheat, corn, rice, okay? In all of these, you can actually get some of the essential amino acids. And as long as you include what are called legumes, which are beans, between the two, those two together will actually supply all your essential amino acids. And when you stop and think about it, there's a lot of side dishes that actually com contain beans and rice, or beans and grains. So I always think of like as a kid, you would take peanut butter and jelly on bread. Peanut butter, peanuts are actually legumes. They're beans. Bread is your grain. So eating a peanut butter and jelly sandwich actually gives you all your complete, it's a complete protein source because it's providing amino acids, the essential amino acids from those two categories. So you go out and you have Mexican food and what do you have? beans and rice, okay? Refried beans and Mexican rice, same thing. Rice is the grain, the refried beans is the legume. So that itself is a complete protein source. Black beans and rice is another common one. Red beans and rice, another common one. So that's oftentimes like a side dish. And it's because you may end up having, in, in a lot of other countries, the United States, we really like to overdose on, on protein, on animal protein. But in a lot of countries, that's kind of the primary dish. And it may have just a little bit of animal protein added, but it is not the primary protein source. Okay, So it's just a lot of variation. But as long as you get both some kind of grain and some kind of um, legume, then you're going to end up having all the essential amino acids that you need to build. If you don't get these essential amino acids, that means that your body cannot build the proteins that it needs in order to function. So we're going to talk about function sort of in the second half of the chapter. So this is one that I found. It's not in your book, but you will oftentimes see amino acids not written the entire name. So yes, I agree. Phenylalanine is kind of a long word, right? So, um, tryptophan, asparagine, trying to remember how to spell all of these and remember them all. So oftentimes you won't see them written out their full name. They'll just use what they call the three letter code. It's an abbreviation. So instead of saying phenylalanine, you'll just see P-H-E. So if you see an amino acid with just this three letter abbreviation, G-L-Y for glycine, just remember that it's there is a whole word to it. Sometimes that throws people, they're like, I don't know what these three letters mean. Like, I don't know what their, what their reasoning is, but that's actually just a way of trying to shorten it. There's even a one letter code, but even I can't keep track of all those. So I have to keep this out if I ever see them. Cause I'm like, I don't know what Y is. I can't remember. So I can pretty much tell, like I can tell tyrosine is TYR. So most of them, it's sort of like the first three letters of the amino acid. But if you see those three, that's what they're referring to. So now how do these amino acids get linked together? They get linked together as a condensation reaction. 
So remember that condensation reactions always form what? If you have condensation, then what do you see? Water. Mm -hmm. So remember that water is a product. Remember in the glycosidic bond where we pulled a hydrogen off of one sugar and alcohol off of the other sugar to form the link between the two sugars? The exact same ha thing happens with proteins. The link that is formed is called a peptide bond. That is the bond between amino acids and it can form a chain of amino acids that can be short. You could have 10 to 15 amino acids in the chain or it could actually be hundreds. So kind of think about it like those carbohydrates as well where we can have just the disaccharides, just two sugars linked, but we can also have polysaccharides where we can have hundreds of sugars linked together. Same thing can occur with a protein. So this link this connection and the order of the amino acids is what forms what they call the primary structure of a protein. So the primary structure, it is really just the order of the amino acids. So in this first example, they just show you how a peptide bond is formed. So the first amino acid is alanine. And so in that, here's its R group. Right, so it's CH3 is the R group. So the rest of it, that NCC, exactly the same. The next one over is a valine. And so here you can see, this is its R group. So notice if you kind of took the R groups off, they look exactly the same, nitrogen, carbon, carbon. So what happen is, happens is, is the nitrogen loses its oxygen from that, the sort of side carbon the nitrogen of the valine loses two hydrogens. So you have two hydrogens and one oxygen, and these combine and form water. So the oxygen comes off of one of the amino acids, two hydrogens off of the nitrogen of the other amino acid, and now we have the link. So the link that is formed is between the second carbon and the nitrogen of the next amino acid. So we form this connection. And that is the peptide bond. Now, if you look at it, do you see that it's an amide? So remember nitrogen, if there's a carbon connected to it with a double bond oxygen, it's an amide. That is the link. So this just forms a dipeptide because it's just two amino acids linked together. And also notice that now I have nitrogen on one end and that carbon with the two oxygens on the other end. So proteins actually have like a beginning and an end. So you couldn't just take and flip them backwards. They have a direction to them. So we can form this. So this is going to be forming a small protein. So this is just four amino acids. So can you see this is amino acid? One, two, three, and four. Okay. And if you look and kind of go across the row, nitrogen, carbon, carbon, nitrogen, carbon, carbon, you can kind of see that with each one. So as, as you go across to do this link, the very first one starts off, the nitrogen is not changed, so it's still positive charged and it's got three hydrogens on it. That's the amine end or the nitrogen end. This middle carbon never changes. It's not involved in a peptide bond. So the middle carbon is gonna look exactly the same. But it's the carbon that's on the end. The carbon on the end keeps its double bond oxygen but it loses the oxygen with the negative charge. So this oxygen comes off and these two hydrogens come off and that forms the link between amino acid one and amino acid two. So now that nitrogen's lost two hydrogens and so now it's a, this peptide bond is the link between them. Amino acid two, nitrogen now only has one hydrogen. Carbon in the middle doesn't change. Carbon on the end loses its oxygen to form the link with amino acid three. So I pull off the oxygen, pull off the two hydrogens, and now I have the link. Carbon in the middle doesn't change. It's still just a carbon with its R group hanging off. The carbon on the end loses its oxygen to form the link with the nitrogen on carbon on amino acid number four. Amino acid number four, middle carbon doesn't change. And the end, 
since it's not attached to anything, remains the same. So here, 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 those are the peptide bonds. They're just the links that are formed. I could just keep doing this. NCC link, NCC link, NCC. So that, that chain of the amino acids, they call that the backbone. So can you kind of see how it just forms this chain? Then hanging off of the chain are the R groups. Say it again. Water. Okay, right? So when these get pulled off, I get water. I get water, so I'll actually have three water molecules after this is done. So I form three peptide bonds. Every peptide bond forms a water. The order, what amino acid um, number one is, number two is, number three is, and number four is, that creates the primary structure. So it's just the order of amino acids in the chain. Sometimes you'll see it written with a little one with a degree. That's kind of like the first degree of structure is sort of the way that they're referring to it. It's just a short way of saying primary structure. So seeing either way written out as primary structure or that one with the little knot is also the same thing. So it's just the order of the amino acids in the chain. So when you look at this, you think, oh, well, this must go ahead. Yeah, that was like when they wanted you to like note and do the, the little app, like I'm trying to remember what they call it, like a notation to yeah. it is Isn't trying to mark it. It's so in this, you'll see the next one is the secondary structure. They'll put a two and a knot. Okay. So the little circle is kind of like degree. So this is like the first degree of structure. Okay. So that's kind of what they're, that like short abbreviation is referring to. So if you see it written out that way, it's just a way of kind of shortening the word primary. <laughs> so instead of writing primary, you write the one with the little zero. So example, example of the order of the amino acids comes into play in, in patients that have what is called celiac disease. So not as much today, but say within the last 10 years, the whole gluten sensitivity thing became really big. People were like avoiding gluten like it was like, like toxins, <laughs> like the plague. <laughs> it was really bad. No, gluten was terrible and you should stay away. And so people were like, I don't even know what it is. <laughs> Okay, gluten is a protein found in grains. Gluten is found in all of your wheat. So wheat grain, so anything made with flour is going to contain gluten. Any crackers, any breads, cereals that contains flour, wheat products all have gluten in them. So wheat, barley, um, rye, like all of the types of grains that are more as a seed, there's really only a couple of grains that don't have gluten proteins. That would be rice and oats. So patients that would eat this, eat any kind of a flour that is a wheat-based, rye-based, oats, not oats, but um, like barley-based, they, when they digested the protein, the protein would get broken down into smaller proteins, which is normal in digestion. When you eat big proteins, you gotta break them down. Those smaller pieces, when they would get into the small intestine, they were actually seen as foreign. Has celiac disease? Yep. So it is. That is that is the big huge challenge, and what you will find. So yeah, the gluten the gluten section. Yeah, a lot of people just order their stuff from Amazon and stuff just to be able to get what they actually need. So when these small fragments get into the small intestine, there are clusters of immune cells right underneath the lining in the small intestine. And their goal really is to just watch what comes through so that if anything foreign ends up in the small intestine, that can trigger an immune response so you can get rid of it and not let it get absorbed. But these harmless fragments are seen as foreign and they trigger an inflammatory immune response. This inflammatory immune response actually causes inflammation in the lining of the small intestine. This can 
cause the pain, gas, bloating, nausea sensation. But the big problem is, is this can cause this change. So if you look at, see if it's gonna let me do it. So if you look at this, this is what the lining of your small intestine looks like normally. So you actually have these visible folds. When you look at it in the microscope, it kind of looks like carpet, okay? You have these little tiny folds in the lining of the small intestine. So nutrients come down and rub up against those folds and that allows them to get absorbed. So they really say like your small intestine has like a 3000 square foot surface area because of those folds. That's like a house, like a big house floor, okay? That's how you absorb things so well is because nutrients go along those little fingers, bump up against the wall, and once they're small enough, boom, they get absorbed. But this is what happens with celiac disease. So with celiac disease, because of this inflammation, you slowly lose those villi. So what does that do to the surface area? A lot. Okay, so that seriously decreases the surface area. If you don't have the surface area, you're not going to have good nutrient absorption. Okay, so that means that nutrients, not just the gluten proteins, but all nutrients pass through without getting absorbed properly. So these patients can end up having malnutrition. I had a friend, like when they would have the bouts, when they have had the inflammatory bouts, it would be nothing for the friend of mine to drop 15, 20 pounds. Even if he ate, even if he like went completely gluten free and was like super strict, his bowel was so inflamed that he couldn't absorb the nutrients that were coming through. And then, so therefore it was all of the issues. Is that why they have those celiac disease like vitamins, I mean, it's not vitamins, but like Nutrient supplements, right, because thinking about like the, you really use your surface area is super important to being able to absorb as many nutrients as possible. Because this tube, your small intestine's like just about an inch wide and it's about 20 feet long. But it's still, there's a lot of processes that happen as it goes along down through. But having this extreme folding really amps up the ability to pull as many of the nutrients out as you need. Because, I mean, compared to like, like dogs and cats, I mean, we're really pretty complicated. We're really pretty complex. And so we really need those nutrients to be able to build and just maintain structures. So that is the challenge with celiac disease. It's just trying to make sure that they, they decrease their exposure to any of those gluten proteins because it causes this sort of inflammatory bowel response that can take, like you end up having to take like the steroids you end up having. Some people have to take um, immunosuppressants just to try and get this under control so that they have some absorption that can go along through. So malnutrition actually ends up being a really big issue for people with celiac disease. So that's just because of the, the, the sequence of the gluten protein. So it's just the sequence of those amino acids that trigger that. But there's not just a chain of proteins. Proteins typically have some kind of folding to them. The second level of structure, so that secondary structure or the second degree of structure, so that little two with the knot thing. So that is because the chain of the protein has, remember that each amino acid is all NCC, sticking off of the nitrogen is a hydrogen when it's in the chain, but sticking off the carbon is a double bond oxygen. So this sets up hydrogen bonding. So remember in hydrogen bonding, I said if you have two nitrogens or two oxygens or an oxygen and a nitrogen, and one of them has a hydrogen, then they can form that hydrogen bonding where that hydrogen kind of forms a bridge of attraction between the nitrogen and the carbon. So in this, if you look at, see if we can do this. <laughs> okay, so in this, if you look, do you see that the chain, as it sort of creates this helix or this coil, do you see that carbons with their double bond oxygen begin to automatically line up and they can form hydrogen bonds with nitrogens that have their hydrogen attached? So that's those dot, dot, dots. So all those dot, dot, dots begin to create this like spiral that they call a helix. They call it an alpha helix because of the way that it twists. So it twists this way instead of that way. So they always go, that's where the alpha term comes from. Alpha helixes, I think of this as creating like a spring. 
So now I can take this protein. If it was just a straight piece, like a spaghetti noodle, and I pulled on it, it could snap. But this is going to now give me flexibility. So you can imagine taking the ends of this protein and pulling, and you could stretch it out and it would bounce back. So I've now got some flexibility. It's not quite, it's a little more stable. It has this ability to sort of bend and shift with decreasing the risk of it actually getting broken. So Alpha Helix is going to make, now it won't go back. Alpha Helixes are going to help make a stronger structure. The challenges are real. <laughs> okay, there. It'll make a stronger structure, more flexible, less tendency to break. There's another type of secondary structure too, and this is where the chain like folds back on itself. So it folds back on itself and creates hydrogen bonding along those sort of ripples. They call that a pleated sheet. Again, can you imagine that this now has the ability to kind of bend in and stretch out? Also has the ability to sort of flex back and forth. I always think of like a paper fan, like when you were a little kid, did you make a paper fan? You know, you fold it back and forth and back and forth and then you sit there. So that's really what this is, is the, the strands form this kind of like ripply kind of appearance. And in that, oh, mm -hmm. they haven't, is it big, one of those big ones? As long as it's, <laughs> don't step on it, it might be a stink bug. <laughs> It's furry. <laughs> worst comes to worst, you can always put a periodic table on them and smash them. <laughs> I'll just clean it up later. <laughs> All right, so pleated sheets and alpha helix, just remember that this is actually the backbone, not the R groups, but the backbone that creates this and improves flexibility stability of the chain itself decreases the chance that it'll actually snap or break. Example with this, so Alzheimer's is actually where you have a change in secondary structure. So normal, oh, I didn't fix this. So people that do not have Alzheimer's, normally they have proteins that are in and between neurons that is called the beta amyloid protein. So this is what normal looks like. These are what? What kind, what would this be called? This is, it's secondary, but what would you call that if it has that look? It's a helix. Mm -hmm. So this has the alpha helix structure. That's the normal structure. But they have found that people that develop Alzheimer's, their beta amyloid proteins, these are just proteins in the brain, proteins within neurons, between neurons, they actually shift to this. Can you see what this shape is? That's the beta, right? So remember the pleated sheet sort of forms like this rippled layer back and forth. So it then turns back into this or changes to this beta pleated sheet. The problem is, is the beta pleated sheets clump. So they start to stick or cling together and that forms what they call those neuro tangles. So literally neurons then, their little fiber extensions all get twisted together and you lose the ability to send the nerve impulse. So with Alzheimer's, what is commonly de develop? Dementia, memory loss. Then you start to, like first you start to forget like occurrences and you start to forget people's names. Then you kind of start to only remember things that were in the past. So then that's the one where, you know, like people start to think people are other people because it was somebody they knew 25 years ago. And then eventually they lose that Pretty much everybody becomes a, a stranger type of thing. Then they lose the ability to do like the normal functions. So feeding themselves, dressing themselves. They kind of begin to revert back. Oh, I haven't seen it. <laughs> okay, so this is what leads to dementia, functional brain loss.
all because of changes in the folding that happens in these proteins in the brain. So that's an example of like how important that secondary structure or secondary structure is. Tertiary structure. So the third level of structure, this is the R groups. Okay, so the reason that we talked about how you have the hydrophilic and hydrophobic. So remember when we talked about my cells, what ends up being in the center of the my cells of the soap? Yeah, oil, bacteria, the hydrophobic, those fatty acid chains like stuck down into the center and that pulled in anything that was also hydrophobic. Well, it's the same thing. Those R groups are going to want to cluster and form little hydrophobic centers within the protein because hydrophobic in water, what happens? If something is hydrophobic and it's around water, they're gonna be repelled. They're gonna to try to move away from each other. So the hydrophilic, oh, it is coming this way. Oh, no. Well, I don't want it to be so distracting. <laughs> <laughs> now you can pay attention. <laughs> so the nonpolar, those nine hydrophobic regions, those are going to bury themselves inside of the protein. They're not going to be on the outside edge. So if you think, okay, here's our protein. And along in that protein, if I have this amino acid, this amino acid, this amino acid, and these ones are all hydrophobic, they're going to end up clustering. So they're going to end up so that, that now they are all like this. And so the rest of the amino acids then end up looping around, looping around, looping around. So now I go from having something that could possibly be a chain to now it suddenly like kind of like bunches up and I get a lot more folding. Things that are hydrophilic are going to want to be on the outside because they can interact with water. They can interact with each other. Here's a good picture of a protein showing secondary structure and tertiary structure. So where's the secondary structure? What do you see that looks like secondary structure? Yeah, the coils, right? So do you see the alpha helixes? So there's like one, two, three, four spots where it starts to coil like a spring. So this, that's alpha helix. That's just where, remember, that secondary structure. Do you see an area that looks kind of like a pleated sheet? Do you see that one where it folds back on itself? So that's also secondary structure. But then on top of that, we have this. So here, these are hydrophobic R groups. Hydrophobic means they're nonpolar. And if you look, do you see that they're nothing but like carbon? So looking at this one, there's like an aromatic, another aromatic, a CH3, CH3. These areas, nothing but carbons and hydrogen. So they like form their own little clump, their own little cluster. And that creates sort of this bend that's going to change or alter how the helix might have been. There's other examples. So remember the sulfur amino acids? If sulfur amino acids are near each other, they can actually form links called disulfide bonds, two sulfurs linked together. Those are really stable. So that's almost like forming like a permanent bridge. Another example, here is the salt bridge. So remember the positive and negatively charged R groups in those, those five amino acids? They can actually form ionic interactions. Remember that those are the strongest of the intermolecular forces. So those are also going to be like two little magnets stuck together. So that can actually connect. So I could have an amino acid here, an amino acid here, distant on the chain, but now they're suddenly pulled in together and really stable, and that can create a lot of folding. So if you have a lot of three-dimensional structure, your protein may end up looking kind of like this. <laughs> so that looks like scribbles all over everywhere. It's just one chain. But areas in the very center are going to have little hydrophobic regions because that's where those hydrophobic amino acids are going to go to. Areas around the outside are going to be more hydrophilic so they can interact with water. They call this typically a globular protein because it looks like 
a glob. So it just sort of looks more spherical, more three-dimensional, more like a ball. If you remember when we were talking about enzymes, I drew the enzyme looking kind of like a little E laying down. Okay. And the reason I did that is to show the shapes. Remember, that's where the two reactants like fit. The shape of globular proteins is really important to their function. So having all this folding actually creates a shape so that it can interact with other molecules. Think of like the lock and the key. Okay. So the shape of an enzyme may allow a certain molecule to be able to fit into one little cleft or one little cubby kind of like space a curve on that protein, and it needs to have all that folding in order for that to function. See if it goes. No. <laughs> Sometimes, so globular proteins, globular proteins have this real spherical shape. So here's a good example. You can still see a lot of alpha helix in that one. See, it looks like curling ribbon. Right? So you can see a lot of those coils of the alpha helix, but then they fold back on each other. So you have more of this globular shape. Great example of a globular protein, enzymes. Okay? Because they have to have that shape in order to interact with things. But you can also have what are known as fibrous proteins. Fibrous proteins don't have a lot of tertiary structure. So they're pretty low in terms of tertiary structure. Fibrous proteins look a lot like this. So here's their two examples. The one that's on the right is collagen. Collagen is the most abundant protein in the body. All of your connective tissues are made of collagen. Bones, cartilage, tendons, ligaments, all those dense tissues like dense regular and dense irregular tissue, all the anchoring kind of tissues, that's all made by collagen. So when you look at it though, do you see how it looks stringy? Right, so when you look at that picture, do you see how it looks thread-like? That is because it doesn't have this big folded globular shape. Instead, it does have alpha helix, but if you look at those purple, do you see the alpha helix structures? But they just form like long alpha helix chains. So they really look almost like strands. Keratin is the other example, and there's it's showing a hair, um, a hair shaft. Keratin's job is in your hair, in your nails, on the surface of the skin. Those cells fill with keratin and that acts to do what? Keratin is a, it's a waterproofing protein. What it does is it helps to keep water from being able to penetrate into layers of the skin. So notice how those, that, the hair cells on that hair shaft look like little flattened scales, almost like roofing tiles. That actually, like the keratin, pushes water out of the cell and causes the cell to flatten. But then another one layers in and layers in, and that creates this nice protective cover. So remember your epidermis, all those layers that are on, they're always flaking off, okay? <laughs> they're always flaking off. You lose like a million of them a day, just constantly flaking off on everything. But it actually helps to create a really good barrier that keeps things from being able to migrate in. It helps keep things from being able to wash off or wash away easier, maintaining the skin's barrier. So those are good examples of fibrous proteins. Tendons, ligaments, other good examples because they're really just big, thick bundles of collagen. So you tell me, and I'm sorry that this is in blue because I know it's kind of hard to see, but you tell me there's amino acid one, two, three, four. Amino acid one, where would this R group be? Is it polar, we'll say hydrophilic or hydrophobic? What do you think? Looking at this, looking at the blue, hydrophilic, right? That's a charge group. See that oxygen, it's kind of hard to see, but that oxygen does have a negative charge to it right here. So that is definitely hydrophilic. That is going to be found either with a positively charged R group or it's going to be found on the outside of the protein wanting to interact with water. What about the next one? What do you see? 
Mm -hmm. Three nitrogens, one of them's charged. Definitely hydrophilic as well. So being either polar or charged is going to make it want to interact with water and with each other. But now what about the third one? Hydrophilic, hydrophobic. Hydrophobic. Notice there's nothing but carbons and hydrogen. Right? So this one's going to want to bury itself. You are not going to see this one interacting with the ones next to it. So it's going to create like this sharp bend. It's going to want to end up being tucked with. What about the next one? That one's hydrophilic because of that OH, because that alcohol group. It's not the most hydrophilic. Not like those first two. What about the next one? Hydrophobic. See that there's nothing but carbon, 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 carbon. No oxygen, no nitrogen, no charge. So that's going to be hydrophobic. So these two are going to like cluster together. So you'll have the chain will kind of take like this sharp bend so that these two hydrophobic groups can like clump together. What about the next one? Yeah, that one's really hydrophilic because it's a ring, but it's got two nitrogens and one of them is charged. Believe it or not, that is an amino acid. This is proline. Proline's an oddball because proline is a carbon, 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 where it links from the middle carbon onto the nitrogen. So see the difference, what happens there? But what would that be? Hydrophilic, hydrophobic. Carbon, carbon, carbon. So this, mm -hmm. so nothing but carbon, carbon, carbon on those. And so that's also another hydrophobic. And what about the last one? It's hydrophobic as well. So you, can you see all four of those would be like right here, okay? And then that one, that one hydrophilic in the middle, the R group would get like pushed off, sticking off away from those other four so that they could cluster together. So this would create a curve to sort of protect or hide those hydrophobic R groups. Fourth level, last one. Last level of structure is not all proteins have this, but some proteins are made of more than one protein chain. So that creates what they call quaternary or the fourth degree of structure. Quaternary structure is when you have two or more proteins that together form a large complex. Common way that they're referred to is that it's a protein complex. Just means more than one. Now, in fact, if we flip back, can you see, can you see that collagen and, and keratin that they're actually, if I do this, then it's never going to let me out of it again. Well, can you see that, that collagen and keratin have quaternary structure? That, that collagen is actually three chains? And if you look at it, the next time you see like thread, look at a piece of thread up super close, and it looks almost identical to collagen because they actually take cotton or polyester fibers and they wrap them into this really strong, so one strand is not, if you had a single thread, it would not be very strong, but wrapping multiple threads together increases its durability dramatically. So collagen doesn't have a lot of tertiary structure because it's not real folded, it's more fibrous, but it does have quaternary structure because it's multiple protein chains wrapped to improve strength. Keratin only has two. So keratin, you see, is not quite as tightly wrapped. So they're both similar, and that they're more thread-like, but collagen is much better as a durable anchor, whereas keratin is really there to help decrease any water from hanging about. So here you can see this one. So this, the example here is hemoglobin. Hemoglobin. Okay, so hemoglobin, you find this where? It's in your blood, and it's specifically a one kind of cell, red blood cells, okay? Hemoglobin is the reason that red blood cells are red. So in this, this is actually trying to show all four levels. So let's see if we can. So the primary structure for hemoglobin is just the order of the amino acids, right? So that was the primary structure, just how this one linked to this one linked to this one. Then when we go to secondary structure, that is when you get the coils, or the pleated sheets of the backbone to give it more flexibility, a little more stretchiness and stability. 
tertiary hemoglobin has this folded, you can still see the coil, the secondary structure in there, but it has this tertiary structure where it's very folded. Now, there's something that else that's in there. Do you see the little red thing with the ye little yellow ball? What's that? What, is in, what does hemoglobin have? It's the whole reason that red blood cells are red. Nope, that's, it's red because when it carries oxygen, it's bright red. When it doesn't have oxygen, it's dark red, but it's still red. <laughs> Sometimes you can't give blood because you don't have enough of this. Iron, that's what that little piece is. So that little piece in the center, every hemoglobin protein actually holds an iron and it's the iron that actually binds the oxygen. That's why if you don't have enough iron in your diet, you end up anemic and you like get tired really easily. That is because of lack of the ability to carry the oxygen. So that's why you've got that little red piece in the center is iron, but this is not hemoglobin, this is. So hemoglobin is actually four proteins. There's two that are the purple and two that are the gray. There's alpha subunits and beta subunits, but in those it's actually four proteins. When you put all four together, they carry oxygen better than if it was all by itself. So that's the reason you have that complex. It's a really large protein. And this makes up 90% of your red blood cell. The inside red blood cells are basically just a bag of lots and lots of hemoglobin. So all their job is, is to carry oxygen. They get formed, they last about 120 days, they get filtered out and you're constantly making more out of your bone marrow. And the, notice that now you've got four irons. So every hemoglobin molecule can carry four oxygens. Each um, iron atom has the ability to bind an oxygen. Okay, so those are the levels of structure. I will quit there. We will pick up on Thursday. I'm like, what day is it? We'll pick up on Thursday to finish this and start talking about 11.